for today, I'm excited. We've got Max Pruden who's going to be speaking and sharing God's word with us today. Max is one of our deacons. He's been chartered, part of our church for a long time. Uh, he shared in the first service. He ended up here because he was chasing after Elizabeth, who's his wife, um, and this is where her church home was. So Max, now this is his church home. But he's been around, and he's part of our church family. Uh, he is a professor of mathematics, uh, but don't hold that against him, those of you who hate math. Um, he has also, over the last few months, he has earned his master's of divinity. As God's been putting on his heart to dig deeper into God's word and pursue ministry. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there. There's a lot that God's laying out in front of him. He started his PhD work now. Uh, but this morning, Max is going to come and share God's word with us. I am so blessed by him and to have him as my brother and on our board. And so would you just everyone here welcome Max. Max, come on. Uh, well, I was here earlier, and then now it feels new again. I don't understand that. I feel like I'm, I'm standing here for the first time, but I was here earlier. So um, thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. Uh, Pastor and I, we've been talking about this for a long time, you know, about having me up here sharing God's Word with you. But, you know, certain things should never, ever be um, rushed. Sometimes you have to wait on God's timing, you know, before you can make a move. And I think that's what happened. But today I'm here, you know, about to share God's word with you. And, um, you know, I'm extremely happy, you know, to be looking at you guys here and I'm up here. Usually I'm sitting somewhere there or there and looking at pastor, but today pastor is looking at me. So <laughs> it's my turn. Uh, well, the message that I have for you today is very uh, dear to my heart because uh, it deals with the subject of God's love. Almost everyone would agree that our God is a God of love. In fact, if you step into just about any church on a given Sunday, uh, you probably find yourself listening to a message centered on God's love. Outside of church also, the same sentiment is being echoed, you know, that is God is love. And if one is not a good student of the Bible, uh, you would, it would be natural for you to conclude that God is just a big teddy bear uh, waiting to cuddle with everyone. The obsessive focus on God's love is not only popular in sermons, but it is also um, pre pre present in music. In fact, there are countless pieces of music and Christian songs written on God's love. Now, while the Bible does speak a great deal about God's love, it also teaches us about other attributes of God, which I'm not going to get into today. But in spite of all that, some people seem to focus or prefer to focus on God's love while ignoring the fact that this same God is also a wrathful God a God who hates sin and injustice, and a God who punishes. To them, such a God is simply not their God, uh, because the God they envision or have invented simply cannot and does not punish. It just doesn't happen. This God that they have in their mind doesn't even get angry. To them, God is always nice and cuddly. So consequently, you hear them make uh, uh, claims like, we are all God's children. Or they'll say something like, um, God's love you just the way you are. So my task today here is to briefly look at how God's love is manifested by looking together at the question, how exactly does God love? Which is the, you know, um, the title of my message. And within the same discussion, I'm planning to argue that while God does indeed love everyone, he does not, however, love everyone the same way. And to do that, there are three ways that I'm going to take you through, three ways through which I believe God's love is manifested. The first is benevolently. The second is uh, mercifully. And the last one is intimately. 
benevolently, mercifully, intimately. Now, every fourth Sunday, today is a fourth Sunday, we collect what's called, uh, we collect a, a, an extra offering in this church, okay? And we do so to help those who are going through financial difficulties, okay? And we call that a benevolence offering, okay? We call it that because, because uh, to us, it's the natural thing to do. We're not being forced to do it. It's just natural for us to do, okay? So as such, benevolent love is rooted in good action. Benevolent love is rooted in good action. So this type of love willingly happens for God. It willingly happens for God. It is not a reactionary type of love, meaning you and I, we don't have to do anything, you know, in order to, to benefit from it, okay? In his benevolence, God simply chooses to do good to everyone. In fact, um, in his gospel, uh, Matthew tells us in Matthew 5, 45, that God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So you need, I need you to pay attention to this verse because the verse is basically covering two types of people, and that's humanity. Good, evil, righteous, and unrighteous. So what Matthew seems to be saying here is, God is not choosing who to bless benevolently. He chooses to do so to everyone. That's his benevolent love, okay? So I read somewhere, I read somewhere that benevolence is God's non-discriminatory welfare lavish upon his creatures, both animal and human, even though none deserve the sustenance. Okay. Non-discriminatory welfare, even though none deserves it. So it's, his benevolent love is for everyone. Not for some, not for some, but for everyone. And it seems like the psalmist uh, seems to have understood that. Because in, in Psalm 145, 9, he says the following. He says, the Lord is good to all, and he has compassion on all he has made. The Lord is good to all, and he has compassion on all he has made. There's no discrimination here. Good to all, and has compassion on all. There's no discrimination in God's benevolent love. And someone else managed to capture uh, God's benevolent love. This, he's an existentialist, a philosopher, and listen to what he said. He says, the creation of men is evidence for the love of God. The preservation of men is evidence for the patience of God. And Christ is evidence for the forgiveness of God. Let me say that again. The creation of men is evidence for the love of God. The preservation of men is evidence for the patience of God. And Christ is evidence for the forgiveness of God. So what this seems to be saying is, our very existence is proof that God loves us. Because when you think about it, God didn't have to create you and me. I mean, he didn't go out of his way to do that because he was missing something. God is self-sufficient, meaning he doesn't miss anything. He doesn't lack anything. So by going out of his way to create us, it's proof that of his love for us. And secondly, by putting up, with our uh, stubbornness is proof of his patience with us. And lastly, the death and resurrection of Christ shows his willingness to forgive us. So I know I said, you know, I just said a lot of things very briefly. So what can we conclude from all of this from God's benevolent love? Well, benevolently, God does, not, does good to everyone. He does good to everyone. He sends rain because he cares for the land. When it rains, it doesn't rain just on my house because I'm a Christian believer. No, it rains on everybody else's house. And he's good to all and has compassion on all. So benevolently, we can conclude that God loves everyone the same way. The same way. 
Now, a couple of years ago, I think it was a couple of years ago, I was at home and I was upstairs and you know, my kids were downstairs playing. And all of a sudden, I heard this big crash. I mean, big crash. So as a parent, naturally you would run towards to where the sound is coming from because you know your kids are there. So I ran downstairs and when I got there to my horror, I found one, one of the two limps that I recently bought, one of them was on the floor in thousands of pieces. So <laughs> I, all of a sudden I was taken with anger. I mean, I was furious. I mean, I just bought these not too long ago. These two lamps, this pair of lamps are extremely rare and very expensive, unless you go to TJ Maxx, of course. But, you know, that's a different story. But, you know, my lamp was on the floor in thousands of pieces. I didn't like that. I mean, I was so upset that I wanted to break the other one because you cannot have a, a pair is not one, a pair is two. So now you have only one lamp and the other one is on the floor in thousands of pieces. And not only that, the kids were not nowhere to be found. They fled the scene of the crime, okay? So I had to go look for them. And I found them, <laughs> I found them in the uh, um, laundry room, cowering in fear, because they knew what was coming. Because they knew they did something wrong and they had hell to pay, <laughs> you know? So I showed up there and I'm standing looking at them and then I realized that how, how, you know, how fearful they were. So instead of punishment, you know, I said, you know what, I'll show compassion. I'll extend compassion. I'll extend forgiveness, you know? And that's what mercy is. Mercy is compassion shown toward an offender. That's what mercy is. It's compassion shown toward an offender. And that's how it is for us in God. That's how it is for us in God. If you remember in Romans 3.10, you know, Paul tells us that there is none righteous. No, not one. I mean, can you believe that? The whole humanity, billions of people, and there's none righteous. No, not one. Even this baby that's being born right now is not righteous. So in other words, there isn't a person on this planet who meets God's perfect standards. So we are all enemies of God by default. We are all enemies of God by default. So as such, we all stand condemned before a just and righteous God deserving his wrath. That's what we deserve. However, that's the, this part always kills me when I'm reading those things. However, instead of dishing out punishment right from the start, God chose to make his mercy available to everyone. How? In the person of Jesus Christ. God is always providing a way out, you know? He's always providing a way out. Instead of wiping us, although he had the legal right to do so, instead of doing that, he chose to be compassionate and make his forgiveness available to all human beings. And this is known as his merciful love. That's what merciful love is, you know? And in Colossians 1, 21, 22, Paul tells us that once we were alienated, okay, from God and were enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior, and here's the transition that, like I said, always kills me. And instead of annihilation, we, we, we did wrong, you know, we did wrong. Where's the punishment? God chose to show mercy by nailing his beloved son on the cross. Why? Just so we can be reconciled with him. I mean, do you understand that God had, you know, he would have been within his right to wipe us out from the beginning. He would have been within his right, but he chose not to do that. Instead, you know, <laughs> God proves his love for us while we were yet sinners. He didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My friend, that is merciful love in action. That is merciful love in action. Interestingly, interestingly God, you know, Christ did not die for some, but he died for all, for all humanity. I mean, think about it. It would have been unfair for Christ 
to die for this group and not for that group over there. It would have been very unfair, you know? I mean, after all, doesn't Scripture say that there is none righteous, no, not one? Doesn't the Bible teach that all have sinned and, f- uh, and fall short of the glory of God? That's what the Bible says. Since that is the case, it is only logical that Christ's death is for everyone and not for some, okay? It's for, it has to be everyone. There cannot be any exclusion in what he did on the cross. There cannot be. And this is why every human being has access to God's merciful love. Everyone has access to it. There isn't anybody who can say that, they don't have, that Christ did not die for them. That would be a lie. Okay? So everyone has access to God's merciful love. He did this because he wants everyone to come to repentance, which, which is what Peter tells us in his uh, epistle. But the apostle John t- makes it even clearer in his, uh, in his uh, gospel. He said, for God so loved, what? The world, okay? The world, that's everything, that he gave his one and only son, so that whoever, doesn't matter who you are, whoever believes in him, okay, shall not perish, but have eternal life. The world, he loves the world, and whoever believes in the gift that he's giving. No, no exclusion whatsoever. No exclusion whatsoever. So God has made Christ, the Savior, available to everyone. In fact, Jesus himself on one occasion uh, said, I tell you the truth, anyone, anyone who believes has eternal life. Anyone who believes has eternal life. And again, elsewhere he says, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. See, anyone, whoever, doesn't matter who you are, you have access to God's merciful love. You have access to it. My friend, there doesn't seem to, many, to be any exclusion in God's uh, uh, merciful love. So to fully understand this, uh, we must first understand why Christ had to die in the first place. Why did he have to die? Well, he died so that the initial relationship that we had with God uh, that was broken when Adam and Eve disobeyed in the garden, he died so that that relationship can be restored, okay? Because when Adam and Eve disobeyed, that created a a chasm between us and God. And he sent Christ to bridge that gap. That's why Christ had to die, to pave the way for us, to bring us back to God. And which is what, if you read the gospel, especially the gospel of John, you know, you're gonna see this over and over and over, you know? why did it have to do? Because disobedience against God is sin. Disobedience against God is sin. And the consequence of sin is eternal death. The only way to escape this eternal death is by accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the only way. Yes, the wages of death, the wages of uh, sin is death. But Again, the way out. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The wages of sin is death, and then God provides a way out by providing a gift in Christ Jesus. Okay? So this gift that I'm talking about here, that Paul is talking about here, is his merciful love. And that love is universal for all. I mean, isn't it wonderful that Christ died for all and not for some? I mean, we need to, sometimes we take this for granted. I don't think, you know, too many of us think about it. Because sometimes when we become so used to something, we think we've earned it. We think it's natural, you know. But we need to think about it sometimes, that Christ died for all and not for some, you know. Therefore, today I want you, I want you to know that regardless of who you are, doesn't matter who you are. Uh, um, you too have access to God's merciful love because that's your ticket out of hell. That's your ticket out of hell. So Christ's death and resurrection is the greatest gift, the greatest gift of love 
which humanity could have received. And this gift, my friend, is God's merciful love. So what can we conclude from this section here about God's uh, merciful love? Well, we've sinned against God by disobeying him. And instead of getting rid of us from the start, okay, God chose to show his, chose to show his mercy by dying on a cross for all humanity, for all humanity. This act of love has provided humanity with the means to reconcile with God. Now, since there's none righteous and all have sinned, then all humanity needs and have access to God's merciful love. For this reason, we can say with confidence that mercifully, mercifully, God loves everyone the same way. Okay? Mercifully, God loves everyone the same way. So I know I've said a lot up to this point, so let me just give you a brief recap before I continue to the third and final point. Um, at the beginning, I told you that my goal here today is to show you that God does not love everyone the same way. So far, we've seen that uh, as the creator, God has chosen to lavish his benevolent love on everyone indiscriminately. Since he's not a deadbeat God, uh, dad, God will never turn his back on his creation. That's not possible. Also, we just saw that because of our sin, uh, he's made his merciful love available again to everyone, okay? Because of our sin, he's made his merciful love available to everyone. So both benevolently and mercifully, God loves everyone the same way, okay? Benevolently and mercifully, God loves everyone the same way. So let's look at the, the, the third point, the last one, intimate love. Right away, that should tell you something. That should tell you there's a difference between the other two because of the word intimate, okay? God's intimate love, uh, three things you have to know about it. It is special, number one, okay? It is special and it is conditional. And lastly, it is reserved. So it is special, it is conditional, and it is reserved. It is special because uh, Christ is at the center of it. Christ is at the center of it. It is conditional because it requires the recipient to have already uh, uh, placed their faith in Christ. And lastly, lastly, it is uh, reserved only for those of us who are his children. Now, let me, let, let, let's, let's, let's look at it. Perhaps you're thinking that all of us here are God's children. What is he talking about? You know, I mean, all of us here are God's children. That's what we've been saying. That's what people say all the time. But no, we're not all God's children. We all his creatures, you know. Yes, he created, it, he created all of us, but we're not all his children. Not at all. Okay, not at all. Let me show you why. Let me show you why. Uh, in, in John chapter 1, verse 12, John chapter 1, verse 12, says the following. It says, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Again, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, let, let's see if I can quickly unpack this uh, uh, for you so we can understand what's, what's going on here. By, by just looking at the verse, you can see it's a conditional passage. It's a conditional passage. We'll come back to that part in a minute. But it's a conditional passage. But I need to focus on the verb to become for a second. Let's look at the verb to become, okay? The verb to become is signaling a transition. It's signaling a movement in time. It's signaling a displacement from one state to another, okay, to become. See, if I'm happy, I cannot become happy because I'm already happy. 
That's not possible. I cannot become something that I already am. That does not work, doesn't make sense. I can only become something that I'm not, okay? So John here is telling us, he's talking about you know, uh, um, being a child of God. He say, when you look at the verb, he's saying that, hey, you were not a child of God from the beginning. Otherwise, why did John would be using the verb to become? Why would he be using the verb to become, okay? You either are or you're not. So which means none of us here was born a child of God. So in order to be a child of God, as John says, first, he's the condition, first you, you have to receive Christ and you have to believe in his name. After that, you be given the right, the right to become, okay? To become a child of God. So you were here, first you were an enemy, like we saw uh, Paul told us earlier, tell, you know, in Colossians. We were an enemy. Once you receive Christ and you believe in his name, now you have the right to become. You were not, now you've become a child of God. Now you've become a child of God. Now the same sentiment can be found elsewhere in the Bible. I'm going to give you two more uh, um, references. In Galatians 3.26, we read the following. It says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. You see the condition? Remember I told you at the beginning here, um, God's intimate love is conditional, right? And so far, you know, those two passages are conditional. And who's in the middle of these two passages? Jesus Christ, right? Remember I told you intimate love, God's intimate love is special. In Christ Jesus, you are children of God. And lastly, in Romans 8, 14, it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. How do you uh, get led by the Spirit of God? You're not born with it. Nobody here is born with the Spirit of God. You have to be reborn, like Jesus told uh, uh, Nicodemus. You have to be born again. That's the only way you're going to get God's Spirit to come and live in you. So, <laughs> Paul is very clear here. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are his children. That makes perfect sense. You know, that makes perfect sense. But we seem to, a lot of people seem to miss that because they're so focused, they're so obsessed with God's love that they're forgetting the conditions, you know, that that entails. Okay? God does not, we're not all God's children. That's what these three passages just show us. And I know this is probably shocking to some of you here or watching at home, but this truth has been here, it's been there all along. This is not news. You see, God's benevolent love and his merciful love are available to everyone. However, his uh, intimate love is not for everyone. Why? Because it is reserved only for those who accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, plain and simple those who have surrendered to his lordship, okay? In other words, God's intimate love uh, is reserved only for his children. His intimate love is reserved only for his children. Now, I know I've, you know, I've been talking and stuff like that. Sometimes it's best to use a little illustration, you know what I mean, to, to uh, um, help your listener understand or grasp what you're saying. So I'm going to do that with you. Let me share a little story with you that I uh, heard a pastor was preaching, uh, was saying. He said, uh, um, every Sunday, you know, just about every Sunday, who go down says after church to pick up his kids from the nursery, okay? And he said every time he would get there, the place would be crawling with kids, crawling with kids. I mean, what did you expect, you know? And his heart will go out to them, you know? I mean, when you see kids, you can't help it but to love them, right? And some of the kids, we you know, when they, they would see him, some of them will turn toward him and look at him and smile and then go back to their business, you know? But he said, there are two kids in there, two kids in there within the whole population, OK? 
Okay, that's a small sample. Two kids in there, when they see him, their eyes became wide open, they drop whatever they were doing, and then they yell, Daddy! And then they run to him. They run to him. Out of the whole population, only those two kids have that right because they have a special relationship with him. See, those, he loved the other one, he loves the other kids, but there's no relationship between them and him. He only has relationship with two of them. And that's why when they run to him, he's able to open up his arms and pick them up and bring them close to his heart and kiss them. And that's how it is with God and his children. That's exactly how it is with God and his children. So the question, you know, some might ask is, wait a second, is God playing favorites here? I mean, why is it that some of us are his, his children and others are not? I mean, that sounds like favoritism to me, I don't know. You know, uh, this is a country of democracy. We have to do everything properly. But it seems like God is playing favoritism. So is, is this what's happening here? I don't think so. I don't think so because if you remember, God's merciful love is available to everyone. His merciful love is available to everyone. In fact, in John 3, 17, we read that Christ did not come into the world to condemn it, but to save it. See, the world again, just like John said earlier in 3.16. See, in 3.16, John said, you know, God gave because he loves the world. So Christ came to save it. Now John is saying Christ didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it through him. So God's merciful love is for everyone, not for some, not for some people, okay? And in John 5, 11, 12, we also... Uh, read that God gave us eternal life and this life in his, in his son. And he's the kicker. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. So I ask again, is God playing favorites? I don't think so. God is not playing favorites. Not our, not our, not according to the verses we just read. Now, incidentally, God's benevolent love, although it goes out to everyone, it does not save you or bring you into a close relationship with God. God's merciful love is offered to everyone, but does not save you or bring you closer to God until you accept it, until you embrace it and repent. That's the only time when you can experience God's intimate love. That's the only time. Which, by the way, out of the three, that's the only one that saves. God's intimate love. That's the only one that saves. So simply knowing about God's merciful love is not enough to save you. Simply knowing about it is not going to save you. It is until when you surrender to the Lordship of Christ that you can start experiencing, experiencing God's uh, uh, intimate love. You have to receive and believe in the greatest gift which God has given to humanity. You have to. You have to believe in the one who is God's merciful love if you want to become a child of God and escape condemnation. Okay? If you want to become a child of God, you have to accept this gift which God uh, uh, offers to humanity. If you want to escape condemnation, that's the only way. As John again tells us in 3.18, John 3.18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not stands what? Condemned already, okay? Stands condemned already. Worship team, you wanna come back? Um, so <laughs> let me try to wrap this up for you. Okay, so we can try to make sense of it. My, uh, if you're only experiencing God's benevolent love, if that's all you're experiencing right now, today is the day for you to understand that as a sinner, you need to also experience his merciful love. You need to turn around in the direction that you're going. 
and repent so you can experience God's merciful love. Don't think you're too far gone for God to forgive you. Not at all. You need to run to him. You need to run to him and repent so you can experience his merciful love. Now, those of you who have already received God's merciful love and have gone no further, you need to press on toward a relationship with God through his Holy Spirit. You need to surrender fully to God's Spirit. Let him do his work in you, uh, transforming you into the likeness of Christ. I hope I have convinced you enough to realize that we are not all God's children, contrary to what, you know, popular belief. And for this reason, he does not love everyone the same way. He just doesn't. But that doesn't mean you cannot change your status from a mere creature of God to a child of God. That doesn't mean you cannot do that. All you need to do is confess your sins to God and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. He wants you to experience more than his benevolent love. There's more to him than his benevolent love. He's looking to pick you up and bring you up to close to his heart like that pastor did for his two kids, where it's safe from eternal damnation. If you don't know him yet, surrender to him today. If you've been walking with him, but looking to get closer to him, today is also the day for you to recommit yourself to him. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for uh, reminding us that um, some of us are just benefiting from your um, benevolent love, and that's how, as far as it goes. Therefore, um, these folks need to make a decision. So my prayer today is that uh, in Jesus' name, that the, the, the truth of the gospel will find these people wherever they are and convict them of their sinful nature, thereby changing them, causing them to repent, uh, uh, turn on their heel, and run to you, Father, looking for your merciful love, thereby changing their status from a mere creature of God to your child. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.